Okay, once again, we're at the sanding stage. And this is where, you know, you can either just kind of do it quickly and, and everything. It'll look okay, but it won't have that elegant museum, you know, quality finish. So, um, the sanding is really key, and it's, and it's fun because it just gets prettier and prettier and softer. The wood feels so soft when it's beautifully sanded. So, um, so we started with, uh, this must be 150 grit, and um, took off the corners. Just, uh, oops. Yeah, do watch out for your back seats if you have them in place. Might be good to take those out because I did hit them a few times. Um, so starting with 150 grit, just taking off the corners on the inside and on the outside. Just different angles, just keep changing the angle so you get a, uh, something approximating around. And the same on the back. I didn't really get this way as much as I wanted. Um, so just changing the angle as you go so you get a nice smooth round. But you never get a perfect round with a block. Um, so you want to switch to, um, when you have the shape roughed out, you want to switch to um, the 220, and this is where the 220, the 220 really is going to do nicely. Make sure it's a sharp piece because otherwise it just takes twice as long. And um, your fingers are so good at being, you know, soft pads that will wrap around. They're not going to sand any hard surfaces into the hard corners into the shape. So um, the more sanding, you're not going to sand away too much wood with the 220. That's the other thing. So the more sanding you do with the 220, the more elegant it's going to keep getting uh, more prettier and prettier. And um, as your corners, make sure you sand off any surface epoxies come up. And um, so you have just the wood with no epoxy on, on the migrant corners. And always try to sand with the grain. It's really a little difficult at the corner, but you might finish up sanding with the grain right up to the joint on each surface. So you're standing with the grain even into the corner there. Okay. Well this is if it feels then use your fingers. Any place you here's a little rough spot right there. Um, any place you feel a little rough spot, go back to that and hit it with sandpaper because um, you haven't got it quite perfect yet. Yeah that's much better. No, oh, a little rough spot here too. So especially the joints, you're most likely to have a little rough spots on. So um, try to get those fared out and um, and get the surface, get the surface of the wood grain smooth. Um, so it'll take a nice varnish finish without having to have 20 coats of varnish to get it to look smooth. The more sanding you do, the faster your varnishing will go, so it's not, you're not wasting time, you're saving time by sanding more. Okay, I think you get the idea how nice that's going to look. Yeah, beautiful. Okay. Now it is all sanded, and oh my god, it just feels lovely to touch. Uh, the cap rails rounded on top, and super smooth, and all the grain is sanded. Um, any roughness in the surface grain is sanded out so it'll varnish really nicely and um, oh we went ahead and uh, you may remember that we um, had clear coated our rudder if you haven't just go ahead and clear coat it with a thin layer of clear epoxy on it, both sides and uh, so we uh, rinse that off because um, when you clear coat often you get an amine blush which um, rises to the surface of the epoxy and will keep other things from sticking to it so you can rinse that off. You can use acetone, but you can also use warm water. It works just as well. Uh, it's water soluble. And um, so we rinse that off and then sanded it with, uh, I think we probably started with uh, 150 and then went to 220. And um, so that came out it's so smooth. It's nice to, nice to touch and everything. Very uh, So that'll paint beautifully. Um, we'll be using a primer and then the top coat of paint on the rudder. And... Uh, Oh, but we did forget one thing. We forgot the, um, we've got a, we thought we finished all the woodworking, but there's still the pieces for the hatch cover, for the back hatch cover. So, um, those are the pieces, let's see, in the center of the last two, uh, three pieces, sorry, 
in the center of the cockpit cutout that we took out of the middle of the boat there. And so we'll take those out, those two, which are going to fit right into that space, um, a tight fit, and keep the cover from sliding around. And then the, the top piece, which is the top of the cover, which is larger and will sit on the deck. Um, and they'll all be laminated together. So, real simple uh, job here um, to punch these out, sand the edges, and we're going to mix um, half a large mark of pre-thickened resin, and you could use clear if you're getting short of pre-thickened, but um, could be either one really. But if you use clear, use a little phenolic powder in it. But if you use pre-thickened, I think just go ahead with it the way it is. And so the two smaller pieces get stacked on top of each other, and then they get stacked centered on the larger piece. And so make sure you sand them nicely first, and then just put it together as a sandwich. Um, and let that set up, and then we'll sand it some more. Um, oh, it's going to be easier though for you if you uh, fit these pieces first before they're laminated on, um, because they're really easy to sand now. So take a piece of blue tape and make a handle for yourself after you've sanded. Well, let's sand. Because uh, once these are glued into a sandwich, you, you could, you'd probably have to use a file in the corners. Oh, and the other thing is, um, in gluing these up, don't use huge amounts of epoxy. They're never going to come apart because of all the surface area. And if you have epoxy squeezing out of the edges, if you're going to have to file that off or sand it off somehow in, out of the corner because um, it's going to keep the hatch from sitting down tight. Um, so, so just a thought. Um, it's relatively light coating of epoxy on these pieces. And then um, you can weight them. It's probably the easiest. Or you, or you can use, um, or you can use the... Uh, paper clips, uh, paper um, clamps. And so just take a piece of, after you sand, do the initial sanding, rough sanding, on the edges, take a piece of tape, make a little handle out of it, like so, and stick it on your piece. Let's see, yeah, that'll work. Stick it on your piece like so. Now we can fit that piece, we can hold on to it, and fit it to see if it's uh, the right size. It's, oh, it's pretty close. Needs just a little teensy little bit more sanding at the front front corners. So um so we'll get that sanding done before we glue it together. Okay, so I think that gives you uh, an idea of what's involved in this process and I think you can probably manage <laughs> manage to finish that up on your own. Um, so just a real quick real quick little glue last final. <laughs> I think this is the final glue job. Yep, just keep fitting it and sanding it. You want a tight fit. You want, oh, well, uh, you do want a snug fit, but remember, you're going to have some coatings on this. Uh, you're not going to just have bare wood against bare wood. So, um, if it's a perfect fit at this stage, you can also sand inside the opening, too, um, especially if there are any bumps or epoxy. Uh, but if you have a perfect fit at this stage, um, you're going to have problems after you put a coating on, because coating builds up some extra thickness. So um, try to allow for uh, coatings on these pieces. Probably just a varnish coating on these pieces will be what we'll do. Um, and so try to allow for a varnish, the thickness of coats of varnish on both the insert and around the inside of the uh, cutout in the deck. Okay, well, we will be back with the, when we're ready to start varnishing. So, Nice job so far. Okay, here is the uh, piece and one half large mark of resin and half small mark of hardener was just right. I used the pre-thickened and um, the uh, paper clips or clamps are working well. It's such a small piece and these pieces are uh, look perfectly flat. So you might test the pieces on the table surface, make sure they're flat. If they're not totally flat, you'll do better uh, instead of clamping it like this, you'll do better weighting them down um, against the table surface so it becomes perfectly flat with when the epoxy sets up. I did find that um, with paper clamps, uh, even though I did a fairly light coating on, and I only coated one side of each piece, um, I did find that there was a significant amount of epoxy coming out of the sides that would have been hard to sand away. 
So I've been uh, removing one paper clamp at a time and with just a little little chip of uh, veneer or you could use a little, little slice of plywood with a chisel tip on it. Uh, I've been wiping under the paper clamp and then putting that paper clamp back on and then going on to the next one. I've done that about three times going around. And now I think I've got it so there really isn't very much excess epoxy when I look in there. So, um, so uh, that will help later when you start to fit it um, on the boat that you won't have to um, uh, use a file as much. Um, and at the same time, as I was cleaning off the epoxy, I spread it onto the, um, the edges of the sub-pieces and the um, bottom side of the top piece. So I won't have to coat that anymore. That's coated uh, perfectly adequately. Um, and I don't want to coat this surface because uh, then the paper clamps would be attached in the epoxy. So um, just a few tips there. The tack rag is just an, um, a sticky rag impregnated with something that looks like cheese, cheesecloth uh, impregnated with something that keeps it sticky. Um, it's good every now and then to rearrange it so you're using new areas, uh, new sides of it. And um, it will last longer if you keep it in a plastic, uh, in its original plastic bag or some plastic bag. Um, but it's just called a tack cloth and um, it's very useful. They don't cost much and they do pick up dust better than anything else. Um, occasionally you'll run into a tack rag, it's just so sticky that it gets your fingers all sticky and then if you touch the boat you get fingerprints, which isn't good. Um, but uh, these are Detro, they're very good. They seem to be about the right amount of uh, Detro uh, tack cloth. They seem to be about the right amount of um, tackiness to work pretty well. Uh, and I've tacked everything very thoroughly. First I blew it off with uh, yeah, compressed air. Um, so if you have access to compressed air, that's that's a big help. But you can blow it off, or you know, with just blowing with your mouth, or you can um, a real soft whisk brush uh, could brush it off pretty well. But get as much dust as you can off of it before you tack it. And so tacking um, first, of course, it was sanded all to a really fine finish with 220 grit, um, and then I looked at it out in natural light and sunlight to make sure there were no scratches I couldn't see in the artificial light. And um, actually there were a couple and I brought it back in and sanded some more with 220 grit. So um, now it should just turn out absolutely gorgeous. Sanding, the, the, you, can't, you can't get a good finish um, no matter how hard you try with varnish if you haven't sanded it really well to start with. So sanding is really the starting point for, for a fine varnish finish or a good painted finish too. Okay, and then we have a nice uh, nice brushes. These are these are uh, synthetic bristles. Um, natural bristles uh, traditionally you know were held in higher repute but these are very very soft. It's a very soft bristle and it's a good size for this uh, project. Um, a bigger brush will be kind of sloppy trying to get in around things. This is um, th uh, I have, well it's measured exactly. This is a three-quarter inch brush. Um, what I was guessing. So a three-quarter inch brush should be just right. Half inch, if you get too small, like a real small uh, artist brush, um, it just takes too long. And um, that can be a problem, especially if it's warmer, because when you varnish you want to keep a wet edge, always be brushing into a wet edge. And if it's uh, too small a brush and taking it too long, uh, your wet edge will be drying up and you'll get brush marks left in the varnish, because it won't be liquid enough to flow out evenly again after your brush has touched it. So, um, a nice varnish brush, and then we have a, whoops, don't want to get this dirty. Then we have a varnish filter. This is, uh, I mean, you say, oh, that's a paint filter, isn't it? Well, it's a, it's sometimes called a fine paint filter. Um, but it's much fi finer uh, mesh on the bottom than a real paint filter. Uh, otherwise, it is, it is the same. Paint um, puts on a thicker coat. So you don't have to screen out such fine particles, whereas varnish puts on a very thin coat. And if you use a paint filter, you're still going to get bumps uh, in your varnish that will show that will be thicker, a uh, bigger bump than the thickness of the varnish finish coat. So um, you can use a fine paint, a fine paint filter or a varnish filter, which same same thing um, for paint, 
but you shouldn't use a regular paint filter for varnish because it won't work very well. And then we have a, a little container, quart container, although that's kind of big, overkill a little bit for this size boat. And we have, uh, we're using a, uh, a captain's varnish. Um, it's very, it's pretty high quality varnish, expensive as heck. Um, 10, 15 captain's varnish by uh, Pettit. Um, and uh, it's also called Z-Spar. Um, the two companies are the same. Uh, so that's a nice marine varnish. Um, the distinction between marine varnishes and just regular exterior varnishes is primarily the amount of uh, UV sunblock filters they have them in them to uh, resist you know, 360 days of sunlight uh, outside on a full-size yacht. So any exterior varnish probably is going to work uh, fine. There's a Minwax um, satin or gloss marine uh, spar varnish uh, from um, from Lowe's and probably Home Depot has it as well. It's in a green can, so that that's a nice varnish. It brushes out nicely and uh, and it's easy to use. But um, but the marine varnishes are great. Now um, if your cans this can's been opened already and um, so the varnish. Um, what I like to do is uh, let's look down at the boat now so you can see see things more clearly. So um, what I like to do is use a Dixie cup to, you don't want to brush out of a can um, because every time you dip your brush it's going to have uh, it's going to have little particles on it, uh, dust and stuff and that dust will end up in your varnish can and so you'll never get a good final finish because you've got all the dust from multiple previous finishes floating around in your varnish. So um, what I like to do is uh, use a Dixie cup. I'll have two Dixie cups like here and the first one I'll dip in the varnish and um, get the varnish out of the can that way because it's very awkward to pour out of a can and then the second Dixie cup I'll just set the first Dixie cup in it in the second Dixie cup because the first one's all dripping with varnish of course. Okay so we're ready now to filter our varnish and um, we'll take a look at the consistency. This varnish since the can had already been opened, this varnish is um, really too thick to use. Uh, you think, well, I can brush it, but it's not going to turn out well. Um, see, that is, it's almost like, um, it's like really thick maple syrup. Um, not as thick as honey, of course, but watch the drip at the end. Oh, I don't know if you can see that very well. Let's get some a light surface behind. See how that strand, uh, can you see that? Let's go closer. See how that strand just kind of hangs, you know, and makes a f almost a filament? It's not like a drip, drip, drip like water. See how slow that is? That's the easiest way to tell if you're consist how, what your consistency is. That's way too thick. See that just hangs there. It's not drip, drip, drip like water. It should be uh, a much, much more of a drip rather than a long strand hanging there. So this is quite a bit too thick, so we're going to thin it. Um, you can usually use a regular paint. If I tried to varnish with this, it would not turn out well. I'd get sags, uh, especially on the verticals. I'd get runs and sags, and it would be a mess sanding it out because the runs and sags don't set up. I mean, the surface is dry, but inside it's all gooey. So um, it's a mess. So um, don't start with too thick a varnish. And um, so let's see what we can do. So this is a this is actually a paint thinner. Well, it's really for spraying, but it'll work fine for brushing too. Um, this is made by uh, uh, Pettit, and it's the right thinner for this varnish. Usually, you can get by with a paint thinner, but you, you, there's a bit of risk involved if if it's not compatible. Oh, I was going to say, rather than pour it right in, it's really better if you pour it. It's really better if you pour it into the Dixie cup first, and then I didn't do it. Um, because then you can see how much, and you might not want to use it all. If you thin it too much, you're going to have um, you're going to have too runny a varnish. Uh, the, the biggest problem with too runny a varnish is primarily that it just doesn't build very much, and takes more coats um, takes more coats to get a uh, you know enough build that it's a good finish. So um, let's see where we're at with this. That amount of thinner.
Now look at that drip. Can you see that drip? No, maybe not. Um, it's dripping more, you know, more like water. There's still some thick varnish in the filter though. So let's see if that changes the... Yeah, let's move that up. See that? It's not, not that long sag. It's just kind of a regular drip. And I haven't, but I haven't thinned it so much that uh, we won't get a good build. Um, so uh, I think we're good. And let's start in. We're going to start on the deck, and then we're going to flip the boat over upside down. And um, for this first coat, it's not a big deal, but the reason for flipping a boat upside down is that dust. Uh, Dust falls on things, it settles. Um, and if you have the boat upside down, the deck's going to turn out really beautiful because the dust won't get on the deck unless there's a lot of commotion in the room or a lot of moving air blowing under the boat. So, um, so it's a trick to set something upside down. And also, you, know, you think, well, isn't a, horizontal, isn't a horizontal surface a better surface? Well, varnish won't sag if it's directly upside down on an upside down surface really it'll if you put on too much you you'll get some sags but um uh but it's almost the same as a horizontal surface face up um as far as sagging so um so you have the advantage of not getting dust now when we flip it we're going to set it on the cap rail which um sticks up just enough higher well it's close isn't it yeah, if I don't if I don't set it too far forwards, if I set it across here, the cap rail sets up just enough higher that the boat will be sitting on the cap rail and not on the uh, bulwark rails. And um, so I'm not going to varnish the cap rail at this point. We'll come back. That's such a uh, you know such a focused small project. We'll come back and varnish the cap rail separately. Um, because we do need some way, this way we can varnish everything except the cap rail. Okay, and then the question is where to start on the project. Um, I think we're just as well starting at the bow as anywhere. Um, and I'm going to, let's see, yeah, I'm going to do, um, since we're going to flip it at some point, I'm going to do the top and... Actually, I'm going to do this. Now, see how that goes on? Um, just really smoothly. And it's not, I don't have to squidge it around um, because it's fairly liquid. So, you, you really want your varnish coats to be... If, if your varnish is too thin, all that means is you're going to have to put on more coats. Um, but you'll, you'll have very nice coats and a very nice finish and you won't have runs and sags that will need sanding. Um, so, uh, keep the reflected light. Your only guide is light reflecting off the surface. Otherwise you really can't tell anything with varnish. You might have it twice as thick one place as another, and that's not good. You'll get a run or a sag. But if you use the reflected light, you really can tell how thick it is, or and also where you've missed. Um, where you don't have any varnish or where you don't have enough varnish. Okay. Um, now my problem is I didn't get my lamp set up so I can't see. So let's get some light on it. So never varnish without adequate light. Um, that's probably that's probably one of the biggest biggest best tools in your repertoire is light. There now we can actually see what we're doing. So we're going to do the um, rub rail. We figure the underside of the uh, rub rail isn't going to be very visible underneath here. So we'll um, do the rub rail and then when we do the sides we'll do the underneath part of the rub rail and blend it in that way. Um, Rather than make a joining line, you know, right on the middle of the rubber rail or something, someplace more visible. And 
There is one note. Um, I like the natural wood color personally, but it can be very effective to stain things. Um, if you are going to stain these, the rub rail and the cap, and the cap rail, uh, you would probably want to... Um, it's a little tricky actually. Uh, I can't think how you'd want to do it. Um, you can't stain after varnishing. It has to be before varnishing. And the trick, well if we're painting the hull, it doesn't matter too much if we get stain on the hull. But um, you don't want to get it on the deck because it'll it'll it won't come out of the deck. That's what stain is. It stains things. Um, so if you want to do a stain on the rub rail or the cap rail, you probably want to varnish the deck very carefully first without getting any varnish on the um, rub rail or cap rail, and then and once the deck is varnished. If you spill a little stain on the deck, um, you might want to do two coats of varnish on the deck, so it really is somewhat impervious. Um, once you have, the, if you spill a little varnish on the, uh, a little stain on the deck, after it's varnished, you can wipe it off. It won't have soaked into the wood instantly and discolor it. So, um, so that would probably be the best approach if you're going to stain the mahogany parts um, to varnish the deck carefully avoiding any place where you want to get stain, put stain on, and then uh, a couple coats of varnish on the deck, and then stain the rails, um, and that would look, that would work quite well. But you find the mahogany and the okume have enough contrast to be very, very attractive, just with the natural wood colors. Now one thing about varnishing, which on the rubber rail wasn't quite as relevant, but you could do it there effectively as well, um, is placing the varnish. The first thing with varnishing is don't get too var too much varnish on your brush. Just dip the, the, bottom, the tips of the bristles about an eighth of an inch or at the most a quarter of an inch in the varnish. And then if you got too much just press it out on the side of the container. Um, and then it works very well to place the varnish. So just over the area. First tap is quite light because your brush is full of varnish and several taps and then you're not having to move a lot of varnish around you're just evening it out you're just spreading it out um, varnish doesn't like to be moved from one place to another it's, it's just uh, likes to sort of stay where you put it so um, so that helps a lot too because um, when you start uh, with your brush full of varnish it's going to make a much heavier coating there. Now if we get a little varnish up on the cap rail, it's not going to be a disaster because eventually it will be varnished. But, um, but I'm trying to avoid it because I'm going to be setting the boat up on it. Now, there I got quite a bit of varnish there at the front and way too much. wasn't being quite as careful as I should have been. And I didn't place it very well, but I got it thinned out quickly there. And uh, so I think that's all you need to know. So we're going to do finish the deck and then we have a couple of wood um, supports here that are high enough that the bow is not going to be sitting on the table. We'll flip it upside down and the wood supports will be on the cap rail and we'll then uh, varnish the sides and the bottom. Well, it may be helpful to see a bit of the varnishing technique on these bigger, flatter surfaces. Um, I'm going to turn the boat a little bit for you. So um, we start at the back. Well, the concept is to keep a wet line. Um, never let that dry. If it's over 80 degrees, you really shouldn't be varnishing. 70 degrees is ideal. 75 is pretty good. Um, below 60 six or so your varnish is going to be sort of sludgy and cold and won't flow very well 
so you have to thin it an awful lot so it's not very ideal for below 66 either um, although it's probably below 60 in here but I've thinned the varnish significantly initially um, so uh, dip your brush just the tip of the bristles don't get too much brush on it, load on it and then place it the way you over the area you think it will cover and then just brush it out and need just a little bit more for that to complete that area um, and then when you have it all covered and smooth then you do the final strokes brushing just very slightly into the last across the line into the varnish you had already applied so uh, dip your brush place the varnish over the right amount of area and then brush it out always brushing towards the old varnish and then the final strokes are just the smoothing strokes since I was talking I wasn't watching the reflection there were a couple of places that were I'd, the brush had moved over them but hadn't left much varnish so I just went back and caught those so you gotta keep, uh, keep angling your uh, set head, your eyes, so you're getting reflected light otherwise you can't really tell what's happening now, um, as far as the program uh, for varnishing and painting, there are a few approaches, but I, the approach I'm going to take on this boat is um, a good one. And uh, we're going to do two coats of varnish on everything. And then we're going to tape off the uh, rub rail and cap rail, and um, well, especially the rub rail, um, uh, because then we'll start into the painting sequence on the hull, uh, the bottom of the boat and the sides. And the painting sequence will be um, two coats on top of the varnish. First we'll sand the varnish, varnish finish with 220 grit and um, get out any bumps from dust. And then the um, next step will be two coats of a, a high build primer. Uh, that's just going to be a one part. There are two part primers too that are they have some advantages, but a single part primer will work fine. Um, two part primers can build a little bit thicker and heavier because they don't have to dry. They set themselves off chemical process. So you can get a little bit more build on them. Um, and they, they are surprisingly, surprisingly um, resistant to sagging, even though you're putting getting a thicker coat. Um, and then uh, after the two coats of primer, sanding between each coat, uh, but especially after the second coat. Then we'll do a, um, we'll probably dust it with a very, very light spray, just kind of spattering of like a black paint, some dark color, and then we'll sand it again after that sets up. That'll set up really quickly with some fast drying uh, spray can. Then um, after that dries, we will sand it again and the beauty of that process is that uh, any place, any dips, you'll still see that spray pattern, the, the black dots on top of the white primer. And so it means you have to sand more there. Um, so it, it's a very visual, very visual way of getting a perfectly smooth finish. And then after uh, that second coat of primer is sanded down, um, then we'll uh, do a couple coats of our final pin finish, which is in the color, color, uh, whatever color we choose for the paint system. I'm contemplating just uh, doing a white hull made with a blue, blue um, waterline stripe, but we haven't quite decided that yet. Maybe a white, white top sides, the blue waterline stripe, maybe a red bottom that could be striking. We'll see. Um, but anyway, so two coats of varnish, two coats of primer, then two coats of paint, and we should have a very, very fine finish. Another approach could be to um, another approach could be to use clear epoxy uh, right on the wood surface. The um, negative to that is that uh, even if you've sanded really well, you'll find that the little little hair filaments that bump up and catch the epoxy and uh, so you get a fairly rough surface 
and the epoxy is tough stuff and you can sand it but it takes more work to sand than varnish so uh, overall it's easier to put on a couple of coats of varnish and sand between them than it is to put on one coat of epoxy uh, so that, was, that is my inclination and with the um, primer we'll have plenty of build to have a perfect coat I mean, you can put on five coats of primer easier than one coat of epoxy really uh, because the epoxy never goes on terribly smoothly, it, it isn't designed as a coating so much. You always, if you put it on uh, too thick, it'll, you'll get runs and sags, but you'll always get um, a slightly bumpy surface. Um, so it does require more sanding. And there, we're almost finished, just a little bit more, and I think uh, we'll leave the furniture. Um, for later. Remember we're doing the cap rail separately so we can do the furniture uh, along with the first coat on the cap rail. And that'll work just right. Oh good you're here! And um, we're just doing one extra step here. Uh, we've sanded the hull after the first coat of varnish and it's looking really nice. And uh, this step is somewhat optional but I think it's worth worth doing. Um, you may, maybe you have a perfect seam between your bottom piece and your side piece all the way the whole length. Uh, my seam is really perfect back here, and it's perfect up here. But in this middle, there's just a little bit of an edge where the bottom plank is just a little bit higher than the side side of the uh, boat, side plywood. So um, we're gonna, you could leave it like that, probably not very noticeable. But we're gonna fill that and make it perfect. So I've mixed up a, um, and this is after the varnish is on because it's um, easier to tape after the varnish is on. You're not gonna lift any wood grain and uh, you're not going to get bleed underneath and it's just a nice uh, a nice sequence to have the varnish on before you tape this up um, also uh, you know I just noticed I think I might have a teensy little yeah um, right at the bow um, one of those wire holes didn't fill up yet so I'm going to uh, get that too and I'll probably do the center line right in here no, just this little part from here to here so um it's a little hard to tape the wire holes. Most of them are filled up, but these two do not fill up. Most of these other ones are totally smooth and filled. Um, so the idea is with the tape that you don't want to have to clean up, sand off epoxy that gets all along the side, as you see, you know, sort of smeared along. So with the tape, it makes it really easy. You won't have any excess epoxy. You just have epoxy where you want it, and then you'll sand it smooth, and it'll blend right in and you have a perfectly smooth finish. Whereas without the tape, you're just going to do a lot more work. So, um, tape is a nice, nice trick to use. And it's fairly quick and easy to put on. Just, uh, you do want to make it pretty precise. If you put it so it covers up the area you want to get epoxy on, that's no good. And if you put it too far off to the side, it's not really going to save you much work. And, um, We've gone ahead and mixed up half a mark, half a large mark of clear resin. We don't want to use pre-thickened here because um, we're not really too worried about uh, sagging, a big fillet sagging or something, because we're just using a small amount of epoxy. And uh, the pre-thickened is much harder to sand. So um, we want to use just clear epoxy and mix in phenolic powder. And um, that's a pretty nice mixture right like that is is not really I that may be a little thicker than it needs to be actually but I think it'll work um, let's see and just use a piece of plywood as your filleting or as your smearing stick it's really not filleting it's more like smearing here so let's zoom in you can kind of see the detail here a little bit better right along the edge we'll just do one edge and then you'll I think you'll get the idea if this is too thick I might abort and mix something thinner. Oh, and I do have one sort of just minor uh, denting along here. It's not even a scratch. So I'll fill that at the same time. And again, if you see anything like that, just tape around it and then scrape off as much as you can. Because what you don't scrape off, you're going to have to sand off. And this mixture is pretty good. And um, you do want it, you're not trying to do a perfect finish job, 
at this point you just want to have a little bit too much a little too much on um, so when you sand it down it comes out perfect if you have a little too little and there's not much shrinkage in epoxy but there is a teensy bit um, so if you have too little epoxy on you can have to after you sand it down you have to coat it again and sand it again that's kind of you know redundant so um, you want it to be standing up above the surface and this um, mixture with phenolic powder and clear is actually going to sand quite easily um, since you don't have any of the silica in it so um, that's what we're doing it's just a little ridge ridge of epoxy on it now uh, and we'll do that to all three you know the, the center line where we've taped it anywhere you see there's an issue with it so we're going to get this spread and then I'm probably going to pull off the tape because if I get the tape trapped under the epoxy it's sort of a nuisance it's not a disaster but it's just a little bit more work I think I can pull off the tape without disrupting the epoxy. I'll, I'll see how it's going. You could leave the tape on and then sand down to the tape and then pull the tape off. That's another good approach too. Okay, I think you get the idea pretty well. Um, a little relaxed. I don't know about pulling off the tape. I can pull off this top tape. I think I'll leave the side tape because if it drips down, runs down a little bit, the side tape will protect everything. But I can pull off this top tape, I think. I'm going to pull it off in this manner so the epoxy is pushed onto the area that I want it on. And if you find you're pulling the epoxy right off the joint, um, don't do this. But that looks that looks good. That worked well. Okay, remember your um, remember the uh, wire tie holes if you have any that aren't totally filled. Let's hit those, and um, I'll finish this up and get the center line on the other side, and uh, we'll have a perfect seam along here when this sets up and sands. Uh, we'll probably sand this. Um, we might just sand this down with 220 because if you hit the rest of the hull with um, of course a grit like 150 or something uh, you'll get scratches that you have to sand out with 220 so we'll probably it's a little more you know it takes a little bit longer to sand something with 220 but we'll probably just do the edge with 220 then when we if we sand over the edge uh, we won't uh, mess up our 220 grit sanding surface after the varnishing we sanded with 220 grit uh, just the 220 grit, no, nothing coarser. Uh, if you sand with something coarser, you'll take off most of your varnish. Okay, good. Okay, uh, here we are. Now, um, you missed a few few uh, uh, steps here, but uh, easy to catch you up to speed. Um, we did one varnish coat, very, very thin, and then uh, sanded. And that was slightly, uh, we thinned that varnish, um, so it went on really smoothly, and but didn't, did not create a lot of build. And um, then, uh, remember we, I think you saw filling the edges with epoxy, any place there was a little uh, open crack. Uh, so that went smoothly, and then that got sanded down smooth, before the first coat of varnish, I believe. Or maybe we did, no, we varnished first. We varnished first, and then did the fill along the edges. Um, just the varnish keeps the epoxy from sinking into the wood and also once you have a coat of varnish on uh, and sanded you have a smooth surface the, the epoxy um, when you coat things with epoxy right on the bare wood it's fine to do it but it does require a little bit more sanding because any little filaments of wood um, uh, that is often the little hairs sticking up from wood even when it's really well sanded and the epoxy gets on those and makes a bumpy surface and the epoxy is much harder to sand. Varnish gets on them too, but varnish sands much easier. It's much, it's not nearly as hard. We can do epoxy over varnish uh, and that works fine, especially under a painted coat, uh, paint surface, uh, because we don't have any UV deterioration of the, uh, of the epoxy. I don't like to do epoxy under varnish 
under varnish, uh, clear finish usually, because um, 10 years from now you may have uh, had enough sunlight that the UV will start to break down the epoxy and it just, uh, the epoxy turns yellow. Whereas varnish, um, varnish is somewhat UV sensitive, but it doesn't break down the same way epoxy, epoxy does. So, but under a paint coat, uh, the epoxy will last forever. And so, um, we did the varnishing and probably did a coat of varnish and then filled along the edges with the epoxy, but either way. And, um, either can go first. And then we sanded and sanded the edges really smooth. Um, so, uh, everything's totally flush and just brilliantly, uh, and the way to tell is with your fingers. You can't see irregularities. You'll see them in a gloss, under a gloss paint. You can't see them at this stage, but you can feel them. You can feel variations of less than a thousandth of an inch. So, um, so everything feels very, very smooth now. And then we put a second coat of a, a varnish on after sanding the first coat and sanding the edges and everything. And now we've sanded that. And now, um, we're ready. We're going to go ahead and finish this with a primer. Um, probably take two or possibly even three coats of primer to fill the wood grain effectively. Uh, but we'll see how many coats we need. If you can still see the wood grain, um, do uh, an, uh, you know another coat of primer. Um, and uh, we're going to tape it off with a 3M fine line tape um, along the rub rail so we don't get paint on our rub rail and we have to sand it off. Um, but we have varnished the rub rail now already. If we hadn't, uh, getting paint on it would have been a mess because if any paint, ble bled, paint bleeds under tape, if tape's right on bare wood, and um, it gets into the wood grain if you don't have a finish on the wood already, like a varnish. So we have two coats of varnish on the rub rail. And we've also varnished the um, top sides two coats. And we've varnished all the, the floorboards and all the furniture, the uh, forward seats and back seats and the engine cover and everything, two coats. So we're up to two now. Um, four is nice, um, but five or six even can be a bit, you know, uh, a superlative finish. Um, so uh, we're on our way in our varnishing sequences. Make sure you let the varnish from each coat dry you know, very thoroughly. Usually that's overnight if it's a 70 degree temperature or even, you know, slightly less. And, um, but if the underneath coats are not dry, uh, then the surface coat will start, will take forever to dry. Uh, well, not forever, but it'll take much, much longer. So it's, um, y you progress faster if you let each coat dry very thoroughly before applying the next coat. Okay, so uh, the reason I'm holding my cell phone is to show you the fine line tape. This is 3M fine line tape and I think that gives you your product number and everything. 3M 218 fine line masking tape quarter inch wide by 60, probably 60 yards I think. Um, so uh, that's what we'll be taping off the uh, rubber rail with and um, you can, since the rubber rail does have varnish on it, you could use a regular masking tape uh, although the quarter inch width is is going to be more convenient for this job. Um, but with regular masking tape, there's more chance of getting some paint bleeding underneath. However, it's not the paint that gets underneath isn't going to get uh, significantly soaking into the wood or into the wood grain since we have it protected with varnish. So you would be able to sand that off um, later. But that's extra work, so let's just use this fine line tape and... Uh, Tape it really precisely. Um, and you really want the tape to be right on the underside of the, not just on the top, not just on the surface of the rubber rail, but right on the underside of it. Um, so that's why the quarter inch is better. And you have to really push it right into that corner there. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and tape the entire rubber rail now. Um, this tape changes color when it's pushed on tight. Uh, it, it gets darker, so um, make sure it's not just touching one place because paint will, paint loves to wick under things if if a surface isn't totally tight. Okay, so um, I'm going to tape the whole boat, and then we're just going to use a brush-on primer. In
instead of a spray. Um, but the, the spray would be fine. Uh, but I think the brushing means I don't have to, I can just do a fine line tape and not have to tape plastic over the entire boat. So um, I just felt more like brushing. But uh, So we're going to be using, this is not a terribly sophisticated primer, um, but it will do the job. Probably not as much build as a uh, as a higher price primer. Um, a really nice primer is um, a two-part epoxy primer and um, that builds really beautifully and sets itself off. You can have a thicker build with that uh, epoxy with a two-part epoxy primer because it doesn't cure by air, it cures by setting itself off like epoxy. And um, so with that primer you might, with the two-part epoxy primer, you might be able to just do one coat. The uh, beauty of primers is they're easier to sand uh, than regular paints and they build faster so you can fill grain and such um, with fewer coats and they sand more easily. Um, top coats of paint are great for color and, and sort of an, uh, an attractive surface um, but they don't build thickness or cover or uh, fill grain very well at all. It takes many many coats of of a top coat of paint. Okay, so um, we will be back when I've got this taped up. Okay, uh, so we have it taped up. I did feel um, that to get the tape to stick right into the corner was important and uh, so I used my, if you have fingernails, that's really helpful with a thumbnail to push it in. I also felt that uh, another uh, tool would be useful. Um, this has a nice square end to it, just a paint stick. And uh, so I ran that around um, the entire boat really tight. Of course at the back with the um, fake tail angle, you really can't get a flat tool in there. Um, so there I just went over it with my thumbnail uh, quite a few times. Um, you want to make sure that you have contact. It doesn't have to be contacting anywhere except right at the very edge. But if you don't have contact at the edge, you'll have a lot of paint bleeding underneath that edge. Okay, so now we're um, uh, taped up, and the next step we'll tack the entire boat, tack rag it, and then I'm going to mix up the paint, and um, we'll start to get some primer on the boat. Okay, here we are in the painting shed, and we're ready to uh, put a prime coat on the hull. Um, not the deck, just the bottom of the hull. And we've taped off the uh, rail. It's a little hard to make that tape stick down, so you have to keep pushing it on with your fingernail. Um, and make sure it doesn't pop up, because uh, if it pops up, the paint will go right underneath it, and you'll have a lot of sanding to get the paint off. Um, and we're going to tack the uh, boat first. And uh, at this point, you could skip the tap ta tacking, but... Uh, Tacking it is simple and fast, and if you skip the tacking, you're going to be sanding out the dust bumps that were left behind. So this is a tack cloth by Detro. I like these. They, um, don't, they're they not too sticky, so it doesn't get your hands all sticky when you use it. Um, because if your hands get all sticky and then you touch the product, then you have fingerprints that may show up through through varnish at least. Might, throw, might probably not show up through paint, but might show up through varnish. So, um, uh, it's super easy to attack it, um, and it's more work to sand out dust bumps, so, um, so this is a real easy, quick process. And then we have several primers here, and I'll show you the difference between them. The more expensive primers are going to be less work, actually, and end up with a slightly better job, maybe, but you can use inexpensive primers and get a perfect job, too. So, um, there, that's all it is. To it, and you can see that's a lot faster and easier than than sanding out the dust bumps, and uh, then typically keep the tack rag in its original plastic bag um, because it'll stay, it'll last longer and stay stickier. And as you use the tack rag more, you uh, unfold it and keep, yeah, shake it out sometimes if it gets really dusty, but they last quite a long time. Okay, now primers. Um, <coughs> They're the simple, uh, you know, cheap uh, spray primers. This one's by Zinser. This one's by Rust-Oleum. Um, that's fine, but remember, you're gonna 
you get underspray and it'll get on your deck if you haven't uh, taped over the whole deck or uh, put plastic uh, on the deck and then taped around the edges. So um, they require, they're very fast to apply, but they require a little bit more time uh, prepping. Uh, remember when you're spraying with a rattle can, you just move in one direction. You don't, uh, you don't go forwards and back because every time you turn you get an accumulation of spray. So you start spraying off the boat, do a continuous spray off the boat, and then you come back and do a second one. Um, never go back and forth. Okay, because you'll get runs and sags then. So those are the cheap, um, just regular cheap, inexpensive rattle cans. Uh, this is an, I'm going to use a brush, brush thinner uh, primer. Um, it's just an inexpensive brush primer. Typically, and I want to use the brush primer because I want to show you how many coats it takes of a cheap primer to fill the wood grain. Um, we have two coats of varnish on, remember, already. So the wood grain is starting to be somewhat filled, but it's still on a with a gloss or satin finish. You'd still see a lot of wood grain if we just went over the varnish at this point. So might take, I'm anticipating with a cheap primer, it'll take at least two coats to fill the wood grain. It might take three or even four coats of primer. But it's fast and easy to apply. If you go to a higher price primer, it'll go on thicker um, and be less work and, and potentially have a better finish in the end. Uh, so an epoxy primer, um, since it isn't setting off, um, it's not just drying like um, thin or evaporating, it's actually setting itself off with a chemical reaction, it can go on quite a bit thicker and still set up hard. Um, so this is an Interlux uh, epoxy primer, prim epoxy prime coat primer, and um, it's super stuff. So you get a great finish with this. But we're just going to go. I wanted to demonstrate how well you can do with just regular primers too. Um, so this is actually that's a little bit thin. Make sure I've got that stirred thoroughly. Okay, let's see what we've got now. Yeah, that's better. Now you can see that's going on a lot thicker now. And uh, the, the key to primers is that they're going to get sanded, so try to get your brush strokes out as much as possible, but um, you're going to do a lot of sanding on these. And you can put it on, if you put it on too thick, you'll get runs and sags, but on the slightly more horizontal bottom section, you can probably get it on quite a bit thicker than on the sides without any runs and sags. Runs and sags, as always, are going to require a lot of additional sanding, and so you want to avoid that as much as possible. And on the keel, again, you'll, you'll have more risk of runs and sags than on the more horizontal bottom. Okay, so you can see how you just brush into into the part you've done um, that you've already coated. And this was all sanded with 220 grit sandpaper. And um, so we have a nice finish for applying the primer. And this may be actually coating pretty well. We'll see. We'll s as it dries, more wood grain will emerge, though, because as it dries, it gets the covering gets thinner. You know, I can see a little bit of wood grain in here, so this will not be the final coat. Okay, I think that gives a pretty good idea. Um, stir thoroughly, or else, uh, as you can see, it was very, very thin when I started applying it. Um, and uh, apply it as thickly as possible without runs and sags, and brush into the part that you've already coated. And I think you'll be in good shape with that. Primer does dry quite quickly, so you might get a couple of um, coats on in one day. Uh, sand lightly with 220 grit in between once it's dry. And um, if you think you've got all the wood grain filled after the second coat, you're good. If you need to go three or four coats, that's fine too. Um, no problem with that. Okay, um, so I'm going to go ahead and finish this up and talk to you soon. Okay, bye now. Okay, uh, just a couple more notes um, on the primer. It goes on a little bit like uh, thinned mayonnaise. Um, so uh, you're not going to get even coverage. If you try to get total coverage with one coat, 
you're going to have uh, in too much paint on there and you'll get runs and sags. So, um, so it'll look a little blotchy at first, uh, after the first coat, and you'll have brush marks. Um, uh, the primer is not going to go on without brush marks, it doesn't go on super smooth. Um, but that all gets sanded out after the first coat dries, and then we'll put on a second coat, and that gets sanded out. And if we need, if it's not perfect, then we can do three or four coats. Um, I don't think I showed you up close the type of primer we're using. This is just an inexpensive hardware store primer. But the uh, probably the important thing, uh, most important thing, is that it say exterior on it, um, uh, interior and exterior. So. Um, if it just says interior, don't use it. You'll have problems. It'll, um, it's not designed to be uh, totally waterproof. It'll soak up water and might separate from the hull eventually. So, uh, and this is by Zinser, just a standard brand. So um, nothing special about the primer we're using um, because I just want to show you that you don't have to go all out with expensive uh, epoxy based primers to get a good job. Okay, and this does look like it's filling most of the wood grain pretty well after those two coats of varnish. Um, however, we will definitely be wanting to do a second coat of primer um, before we do a top coat, so at least two coats of primer. And um, so uh, we'll be back with you when we're ready to do the second coat of primer. When this is sand, uh, dried and sanded, we'll sand with 220 grit sandpaper and then we'll go for the second coat of primer. Just a side note while we're out here um, doing the primer, we're just about to lay up a carbon fiber carbon fiber hull for our 50 inch boats here in this beautiful mold. And um, so that's the project I'll start working on now. And that's for our 50 inch carbon fiber version of the T50 racing sailing sloop. Beautiful boat. So another fun project for you. Okay, now we have. Um, three coats of primer on. We sanded uh, fairly lightly before putting on the second coat after the first coat. We have two coats of varnish and then sanding and then a coat of primer and sanding and then we added two additional coats of primer just for building uh, more thickness. And Now um, this is an interesting step. Uh, this is optional but it can improve your finish um, and we'll see if this third coat of primer is has given us enough build. Um, now we're just going to dust with um, just a very fast drying. This Krylon uh, dries really exceptionally fast, but any fast drying uh, spray paint, we're just going to dust it very, very lightly. And um, then when we sand it this time, if it's the final sanding, we will know if there's a low spot because there'll be still some of the residue of the, uh, this is a dark blue uh, dusting. Um, left in any hollows and we'll have to sand it there uh, in that area a little bit more. So it's very very light, as light as possible. And we have added blue tape so we're not going to dust our rub rail. And we'll do the other side the same. Um, the lighter the better. Black is sometimes used. Um, stands out even better than the dark blue. I'll do the other side as, as well. And then we'll start sanding it, and any place we see um, blue dots, we'll know that we um, have a, a dip that will probably show up um, when we paint the surface, especially if we use a gloss. Uh, any kind of imperfections are a little less visible with satin or with a flat paint. You really won't see um, any imperfections, but a uh, satin or a gloss will show up uh, any kind of irregularities in the surface uh, quite readily. Okay, now I think you can see um, the difference between the two sides. Uh, the one side being sanded and the blue being essentially gone. The blue dots are all essentially gone on that side. And we have not sanded through. We got a little bit light in one place. We can't really see it on the with the filming. Well, maybe is it there? It's a little bit thin just right there, you can see a little color variation there. Um, but we didn't, we did not sand through this primer anywhere. So, um, so we should be good for a smooth coat. And you can see there are no, um, no remaining blue dots on this uh, side. On the other side, of course, just, that's unsanded. And there are a lot of blue dots. Um, I'll just quickly give you a, a little indication of 
using sharp sandpaper will make the process go a lot faster. And um, here we are, uh, we're just sanding by hand. And um, so it's uh, just a matter of sanding until all the uh, blue, and since I brushed this on, a lot of my blue dots are in the uh, brush marks from the bristles. Um, and so I want to sand until all those blue um, dots are uh, gone. All the blue is completely sanded off. And I think you'll find that sanding by hand rather than a block will make this go a little bit better. Um, I think with a block you probably tend to stand through more places and, um, and it's not necessary. So that's sort of a start there. Um, you can see how the, this is about half done. Um, there are still lines of blue dots where the brush um, bristles left uh, of little grooves. But on this side, all those are sanded out. Okay, um, so uh, it does make this faster and easier. If you're trying to sand this without having dusted it, um, you're kind of guessing. You might think this was done, but I can tell um, here that it's not done because of the little streaks of blue in it. Um, so, uh, you, and if you do sand through um, anywhere very dramatically, uh, not a problem. You just put on another coat of primer and, and do the same process again. You can use any number of coats of primer. Oh, and uh, this is a 220 grit sandpaper. Um, use, don't use old paper. Use sharp paper, <laughs> otherwise it takes too long. Um, sharp paper cuts much faster. So, um, 220 grit and sharp paper, and just sand out those blue streaks, and you have it. Looks pretty good, we almost, almost got it right in here, so now we just have to expand that area. Okay, here we are. Uh, the boat is all sanded, and um, that's uh, quite a bit of sanding uh, to get it just right. And a couple of notes about the sanding. Use, uh, I uh, used three, two sheets of um, 220 grit sandpaper, actually two and uh, one and a half uh, sheets, and um, with if I just used uh, the same half sheet the whole time, it would have been a lot of work because uh, the sandpaper gets dull as you use it, and so um, when it got dull, I would switch to a new piece, and it sanded quite well. Um, all the all the um, blue flecks are gone. Um, and so that means we don't have any dips or hollows or brush marks left in it. Um, the three coats was, was entirely necessary. You'll see a few lighter patches, like right there on the bow, where we were standing till it got fairly thin, um, the primer coat, but we'd never sand it all the way through it. Um, well, one or two places we might have sanded through it on the keel running back here on the front edge of the keel right there you can see but we did not sand through to wood we still had the two coats of varnish underneath and um, if you sand through to wood you're going to have a problem when you top coat it because uh, the wood will not uh, a thin coat of enamel will not uh, set smoothly on the wood the wood grain will um, cause irregularities in it so um, if you sand through to wood, bare wood, you probably want to um, touch up that spot with primer and um, possibly varnish and then primer, but probably just primer will do it and uh, then resand that area. Um, so uh, you're watching for several things. You're watching, of course, the blue flex uh, to get them all off. You're, um, another thing to watch out for in sanding, you're, you're also watching that you're not getting uh, sanding through anywhere um, or getting too thin on the primer as the color starts to change from white to more wood colored um, you're getting awfully thin on the primer and um, one thing that people don't realize when they're sanding is they're uh, sanding back and forth looking at the part right in front of the sandpaper which only gets a pass you know 50 percent of the sanding the part underneath this actual sanding um, sander, sanding uh, paper, is getting 100% of all the sanding. 
and that's the part you can't see. So that's the part you tend to sand through, is the part underneath the sandpaper, rather than the part you're watching where you're sanding over and back, over and back, and you can see what you're doing in front of the sandpaper. So be a little careful with that. Uh, keep checking under the sandpaper, make sure you're not over sanding. And then another tip, um, uh, when I had it all sanded and I thought it was perfect, or it looked perfect to me, in pretty good shop light, I took it outside and could see that I'd missed all sorts of blue flecks um, in quite a few areas. So take it outside into daylight and uh, check it. And then um, check it in several lights. And then uh, I sanded those parts out and it looked pretty good in daylight. I brought it into this shop um, for painting and put it, it was under, right under a bright fluorescent tube, an LED fluorescent, I guess. And um, all of a sudden I could see some more blue flecks. So um, it actually took uh, four additional, you know, touch up sandings um, to get it to where it's at now. So don't just do it once and say, hey, I got it. Um, check it really carefully in good light. Because anywhere there are blue flecks or brush marks, there, don't think that things aren't going to show. A gloss enamel, especially if you're using a gloss, but even a satin, will show up everything. Things that you can't see with a dull primer, uh, you will definitely see with a gloss enamel. So, um, uh, we can zoom out here, a little bit more interesting. Um, so, a uh, couple of tips there. Uh, don't just think, oh, I hope this will go away. The, the, um, when you see a perfect paint job, what, and you say, oh, what a good paint job, what you're actually saying, or what you're actually seeing, is what a good sanding job that was. Because you cannot do a good paint job unless you get the sanding essentially perfect. The paint job will, be, will not be any better than the sanding. Uh, is um, in fact usually it's much much worse if you haven't done adequate sanding because you tend to want to cover up if you, you can see that it's you know a brush mark or something's going to show through so you spray it a little bit heavier hoping that it'll cover it and then you get a run or a sag and that's a real mess so um, don't you know if you get tired of sanding just put it aside for a few hours and come back and sand it some more but don't shortchange the sanding because your uh, final results won't be any better than your sanding was. Oh, another, another comment. Um, the brush on primer worked fine, and uh, that was, you know, it was easy to brush on and didn't take very long. This was, uh, remember, we had two coats of varnish and then three coats of primer, and we had sanded after the first coat. Probably not necessary, but it doesn't hurt. Um, but then we did not sand between the second and third coats of primer. And this was just a, a Zinsser uh, standard primer. Um, oh, that's made by Rust-Oleum. Rust uh, uh, so it's marketed as Zinsser, um, but it actually is a Rust-Oleum product. And now we're going to top coat it. It's nice to be consistent. Um, so we're going to top coat it with a um, Rust-Oleum product. Uh, here it is. In fact, I'll zoom around here and show you what we're doing here. Um, over on this side, uh, we have our Rust-Oleum uh, white. We're going to do a white hull. Um, we have our Rust-Oleum white uh, rattle can uh, in front of a... Um, it's not actually a heat lamp, um, that might overdo it, but in front of a uh, high intensity uh, spotlight bulb. Um, so we're warming up the paint. We had it closer, but it was getting pretty darn hot. Now it's it's definitely hot to the touch. It's not going to burn me, but it's hot to the touch. Um, the reason for that is it's about 50 degrees outside, and um, if you spray in 50 degrees, the paint is not going to be quite liquid enough. It'll come out in sort of globules, and to get the globules to run together as a single surface, you'll have to spray too heavily, and then you'll get runs and sags. So um, ideally you want to be spraying in temperatures at least 70 degrees, but I have the room here heated up, um, our space heater, uh, infrared heater on the wall there, and we also had a propane heater going down here, um, which we've 
there it is uh, we've turned that off now because we're up to 75 degrees um, so ideally you want the surface you're spraying to be warm so the paint will when it hits it won't instantly sort of uh, to, you know get thicker um, all paints and varnishes and everything are very very sensitive to temperature and uh, they get much thicker in colder temperatures and uh, so you don't get a smooth thin uh, even coating in cold temperatures you get kind of globules and have a lot of problems with running and sagging so we've got our paint can warmed up we've got our boat warmed up we've got our room warmed up and now we're ready and we checked our tape everywhere to make sure we're not going to be spraying um, the uh, rubber rail. And also we have um, we have taped and papered over the bottom of the hull too. I mean the deck side of the hull as well. So we're all set. We also have these um, spacers. It's sitting on a cardboard box, but instead of sitting flat on the cardboard box, we have wood spacers. Uh, it's hard to spray right against the surface because this, the force of the spray hits the surface and bounces up and you don't have the control that you want. It's kind of with the surface right, right, with the boat sitting right on a surface, uh, this part would spray differently than this part where there isn't any surface that's sitting on. We'll have a little bit of that effect right here where it's sitting on the wood pieces, but the wood pieces are fairly thin and so it won't be too dramatic. And we have our tack rag ready. Um, in fact, I set it on top of the boat because it's easy, all too easy to uh, have the tack rag sitting on your table and then forget in the excitement of getting ready to do your final coat. It's all too easy to forget to do the final tacking. You want to tack, you know, within two minutes of spraying because dust comes quickly. Um, so you want to tack right before spraying. And um, this tack rag is a sticky uh, rag that's designed for this. They're not very expensive, so it's probably worth splurging and buying yourself a tack rag. They last for quite a long time. Uh, this is a brand new one, so it's all still folded, but as you use it, you'll unfold it and use new surfaces. Um, and so it lasts quite a long, you know, should last you a couple of years probably, if you put it back in the plastic bag that it comes in. Okay, so tacking. Now the trickiest part is going to be spraying the drake tail. Um, and we're, since we want, I think we want to spray continuously uh, without having to flip the boat over. That is a thought though, maybe, that we could spray the drake tail and then flip the boat. So we're going to do that um, because spraying upside down the upside down drake tail is not not going to be an easy job. So we're going to spray it, spray the drake tail first and then very instantly flip it over and try to blend in with the drake tail as we spray the side. Um, the drake tail poses a new issue as far as spraying that we don't usually run into um, on our other boats. Um, so, uh, and I'll probably get this upright so we can feel balanced, better balanced, and then, um, then we'll work on the drake tail, and then we'll do the rest of it. Okay, when we spray the rest of it, well, we'll get you. And um, since we're inside, uh, it's too wet outside. Also, spraying outside is always a problem um, for two reasons. One is if there's any wind at all, you really can't spray. The, the wind will carry the spray mist unpredictably, um, you know, in a different direction than you think it's going to go. And so it won't hit the boat where you expect. And also, um, if there's any wind at all, you'll have things blowing into your paint outside. So um, we're going to be working inside, and we have a mask here that will help us, but I'll also be stepping outside to do as much of my breathing outside of this room as possible. I do have a spray booth but uh, in, the, in this room, but I can't spray both sides at the same time in the booth, so, so we're going to try it this way. 
And here's a dog hair. So uh, try to try not to let your dog in your spraying space or your cat or anything in the other animals. Okay, and we should be ready to go. So mask on. Make sure you spray, you shake your paint uh, thoroughly, and I'll move you around so you can see a little bit better on the uh, from the back. And. Um, before we start, actually, though, we'll do a test spray over here. Get a few things out of the way, and make sure that make sure that we have a good even flow of spray. Um, that it's not coming out in globules or anything, but it is so warmed up that it should spray really smoothly. And you can see we have a spray gun too on our spray booth. So, um, well, here's a spray gun, here's our spray booth, but we're just going to do this on the table for this this time. This is a demonstration boat. And, uh, okay, so let's try this. That's coming out very nicely. Yeah, very smooth, very fine mist. That's what you want, no globules. So I think we're good. So now I'm going to spray. You have to be moving when you start spraying. You have to have a can moving as you start, and you keep moving until you finish that spray. Don't you get, um, don't you get a heavy buildup when you start.
Okay, now, um, after the spraying, uh, it, with the spraying, it's pretty difficult to get a um, perfectly glossy, smooth finish. Uh, on the horizontal surfaces, more horizontal surfaces, you probably could spray heavily enough that it'll, it all just formed a single um, glossy coat. But with all the verticals, um, if you tried to do that, you'd probably end up with runs and sags unless you're super experienced. So um, spraying the way you saw in the video uh, with light passes, repeated light, light passes, you're going to end up with a very um, fine orange peel uh, effect. And um, that's if you're pleased with that, uh, that's fine. It'll look really quite nice. But um, let's take it to the next step in case you want to do it. Uh, the next step is uh, to wet sand with, after it's uh, let it dry at least two days, um, then wet sand with a 1500 grit um, wet sanding paper. So 1500, uh, there you go, 1500 and it's the black paper and it's good for, for the wet or dry. But um, this fine a grit, if you sand dry, you'll clog it up right away. So um, now what we, your goal is to sand out the orange peel without sanding through the paint. So now your goal is to sand through the orange peel, sand out the orange peel without sanding through the paint layer. If you sand through the paint layer dramatically, uh, it's time for another coat of paint. But we're trying to um, sand it quite lightly. Watch out for any of the um, edges because that's where you'll sand through. It's hard to sand through on a wide flat surface. So um, the goal is uh, to sand it smooth, get a smooth finish, and then we'll hit it with acrylic clear gloss uh, by Rust-Oleum, and um, then we'll wet sand that and buff it to as high a gloss as you want. If you want a slightly matte finish, you don't buff it. To, you don't use quite as fine a buffing compound. But if you want a real high gloss finish. Um, you just keep going until it's mirror smooth. So um, this is probably the best finish that you can get um, because in the end it's a buffed finish so any dust, little dust particles, it's really hard to avoid having any dust particles, any dust particles will be um, sanded out and buffed out. You can, uh, when you're sanding, wet sanding, you can feel the difference between the part that's sanded smooth enough and the new part. It's kind of warbly here, and over here it's real smooth. It just glides. Over here it just glides. Over here it's sort of dipped into this, you know, little bumpy, bumpy surface. You can feel it with your fingers. You can hear the difference too. Okay, so uh, we'll wet sand the whole boat. Um, keep wiping it down with paper towels to parts you're finished. And this is just super slick, slippery, smooth. And the part I haven't done is kind of drags. Okay? So that's what your goal is. Don't, don't overdo it and watch out for the edges because you go right through if you hit the edges almost at all. At all. So um, a little fine, fine tuning on this. It's not hard. It doesn't take very long. Uh, wet sanding is fun because there's no dust and it's um, so efficient because the sandpaper doesn't clog up. Okay, now it's all um, wet sanded and um, and it's rinsed off really thoroughly. You don't want to have a, a skin of dust over it. Um, so rinsed off thoroughly with clean water and then dried with paper towels. So we have a very clean, um, dust-free surface. And um, when you look at it now, the finish is not, it feels smooth, but if you look at it, you'll still see um, little dipples of uh, where it's shiny in between the, um, the uh, little bumps that were orange peel. When we say orange peel in this case, we don't mean um, a dramatic, you know, bumpy orange peel surface like a real orange, but we just mean just the faintest, uh, lightest, misty sort of spray of, um, of, of orange peel. Um, so um, now it's sanded out and it looks good and I don't think we went through the paint anywhere, so that's, uh, that's important. If you did go through the paint dramatically, you probably should repaint, especially if your um, primer and your paint are different colors. But in this case, we're using a white primer and a white paint, so that does make things simpler. Um, 
And uh, so now we're ready to clear coat with the uh, with the acrylic clear by Rust-Oleum. And then after that sets up, we'll do the final sanding and um, buffing and have a nearly perfect finish. Okay, we just sprayed the acrylic clear. Um, that's, uh, you can't see it in that light. I'll zoom in and so, so you can see the can. So that's Rust-Oleum Gloss Protective Enamel and that's an acrylic clear coating. It dries very fast. Um, and spraying it is very similar to spraying the um, the paint, the Rust-Oleum paint that we use, the rattle can. Um, but you, you do want to make sure you're very light. So uh, it's sprayed. I'm not spraying it now. But um, I do want to show you the motion. So it was um, for the bow that took each spray pattern is about a little less than two inches wide. So that took three patterns there. At the stern, it was just two patterns. If I put a third one in the middle, I probably would have had excess uh, coverage and gotten sags. So it was about like this. And then just a bare overlap. You don't want to build up too much at the start. And, um, and I suppose you could. It's a bit long to do the whole boat, but you probably could. Maybe that might work for you. But I did it in three parts. Um, and then, oh, except I don't think I did three there. I think I watched the spray pattern. Now, the lighting is really important. I moved my table so I had light on the side where I was working. Um, so that's important. And you want what you're working towards. Then this back part's a little tricky because you do have to get underneath it. And notice again we have it propped up so it's not we're not going to get spray bouncing off the table surface um, up onto the boat. And it is paper underneath, tape and paper underneath. On the back you have to be able to get underneath it. So if you have it too close to the table, unless it's hanging off the back edge of the table, you're not going to be able to get your drake tail sprayed nicely. Um, so think all this out. And then go all the way around the boat that way. The surfaces that are the most difficult are these over overhanging surfaces. That's where you're most likely to get runs uh, right in this area or sags. Um, the bottom is going to be fairly easy and you can probably spray that a little faster, uh, a little a little bit heavier. But again you don't want to get a sag towards the, you know, you get a sag along the edge. In fact I can show you I got one small sag um, along the edge and um, I may have gotten a bit of a sag down here off the keel I just noticed on this this side looks like there's a bit of a sag right in that area coming off the keel and um, see if we can zoom in and see this one the lights gonna have to be exactly right to catch it um, I don't know if you'll be able to see it or not I think that light might work for you. Uh, there's a bit of a sag right right where the light uh, is coming across right in there. Um, that's pretty hard to see on the screen isn't it? Yeah. And I also got a bit of a sag right under the right before I got to the drake tail on the other side. See if that shows up. It's just an accumulation right along the edge of the um, bottom there. Do your rudder at the same time um, so it all matches. Uh, where's this sag? There, now you can s just barely make out that sag. Um, and although you really want to avoid sags like that, um, this is going to be wet sanded and um, then buffed. So. Uh, we'll wet sand that sag out. Uh, the only thing about a sag is you really have to make sure that the coating is totally dry before you start sanding or else it'll just turn into mush and then you'll have to get it all off and and start again. So, um, so make sure you 
probably want to let it's uh, if you have any sags especially but even with just the clear coat it's probably best to let it dry for a couple of days <clears throat> before you start uh, wet sanding and 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 then buffing um, and as far as dust bumps it looks quite clean uh, what you're trying for is a wet surface um, a, a surface that looks wet instead of dippled um, and that's a little bit, you know, it's it's edgy. You're, you're right on the edge of sags um, on the verticals, and especially on the overhanging uh, where I got that little sag there. Um, and it, when it dries, uh, it'll be less noticeable, um, but it will still want to sand that out and buff it out, but and buff it with the rest of the hull. Um, so that's uh, what you need to know. Um, a lot of light coats. There was probably uh, four light coats everywhere, and I think I should have waited um, five minutes between each coat. Um, I thought spraying around the bow. It's about 75 degrees, 70 degrees here, 70 degrees, and I thought spraying around the boat and on the sides, and then spraying the bottom one side and then the other side. I thought that would give me enough time in between coats, but I think a little bit more time uh, in between coats. Um, would be better and that might have avoided any any sags so um, that's a recap of that but overall uh, it's quite good and um, turned out well and when we sand and buff it'll be perfect so uh, there you go okay now we're doing great work here uh, just a recap we sprayed with the uh, Rust-Oleum gloss enamel protective enamel and um, we did a couple of coats with that over the uh, very carefully sanded and dusted um, dusted and then sanded uh, primer, the three coats of primer. Then we did two coats of the um, gloss enamel in white. Same color as the primer, so easy coverage. And then we did a very uh, quite thorough coat of the crystal clear enamel, uh, which is an acrylic clear by Rust-Oleum. And... Um, that turned out quite well. I think I could have sprayed a little bit slower, sprayed it, and then come back five minutes later and started spraying it all. As it was, I sprayed it all continuously um, and then started again and sprayed a second coat on. And that worked pretty well, except there was just a bit of a sag right along here coming down from the keel. It wasn't runs um, or drips, but there was just an accumulation right along here that kind of slumped off the keel. So I think I should have let that first coat um, set just a little bit longer. However, um, it all sands out and uh, can will sand out to a perfect finish. Just takes it a little bit longer. Um, and then we let it set up for uh, three days, quite warm, good drying weather. Um, if it wasn't, if it was winter and cooler and not such good drying weather it might be want to be a week before you start the wet sanding and now our goal is to get out any of the stippling um, and we've sanded most of the sides now with 600 grit now the uh, this is gonna be hard to show in the in the uh, with the camera but we'll see if we can pick up some of it um, now on the on the side you can see it's real glossy still maybe we can see some with the light reflecting on it, hopefully, yeah, there you can see, see the stippling there. That's what you're sanding out. See, it's not a perfectly flat surface. There's a little stippling. You're going to get that with spray painting, uh, with spraying it with the acrylic clear. There's no way to avoid it. That's a pretty nice finish, actually, but it's not absolutely perfect. So on the bottom, you can see there's none of that left. Uh, no matter how I tip it, you're not going to see any of that except at the very back where we're still finishing it off you might if I can get the light right on there and the focus right it's going to be hard to focus on there there see it right there we haven't sanded that yet and uh, there you saw it when it tipped there didn't you there that's the only part we haven't sanded yet right towards the back the rest has been sanded with 220 two, uh, with 600 grit wet sanding paper and you see there really isn't any of the stippling left it's all been sanded out to a matte finish and um, we're going to go back to a bright, shiny finish, but um, we'll go finish up with the 600 grit, so there's no stippling on the bottom and then the sides, and then we'll 
move on to 800 grit and then 1000 grit, uh, 1200 grit, 1500 grit, then um, I think we can jump to 2000 then and then 2500 uh, and then we start with buffing compounds and um, we'll go with a buffing compound that starts almost overlaps to 2500 probably maybe maybe a little bit uh, finer than 2500 and then um, I think the next one's probably about 3000 then 5000 and the finest one is probably about 6000 grit and by that point we'll have and it's quite a fast progression because such small steps it doesn't take much to finish each step and move on to the next one um, and then we'll have a mirror finish that's perfect uh, obviously no dust bumps or anything left and none of the stippling and it'll be absolutely gorgeous so that's um, what we're doing uh, wet sanding is super easy because the paper doesn't clog up and there's no dust and so the paper since it doesn't clog up it cuts really quickly um, just use plenty of water and have you, you need the water right there and you have to use the reflection to know where you you don't want to sand through you know excessively and sand through your clear coat because that's what we're counting on to be polishing but you need the reflection so you need the reflection off of the off of the surface to see where to sand and I'm I've got the light just right I'm tipping my head so each little area I can see oh is that done is there any reflection from the stippling left um, in between the matte finish where I've sanded smoothly um, and when it's all wet you can't see that of course so you kind of you have to remember where it was and then wipe it off with a paper towel and then again you'll be able to see it so that's wet sanding and um, then wipe it off and we'll see it'll take you know it really takes uh, since you don't want to sand any more than you need to it takes several times wiping it off okay now that looks pretty good be very careful the edges you'll sand if you touch the edge with sandpaper you'll sand through instantly so sand right up to the edge but be very careful on the edge don't go over the edge there there is just a teensy bit of stippling here still left so I just want to get that out right along the edge but without going over the edge okay a little bit right there you can see the reflection of the you see the shiny reflection of the unsanded stuff in between the matte finish of the sanded areas not really a time to be dusting it again um, but the reflection works just the same as uh, since we since we have a sh shiny surface uh, with the uh, matte finish on the primer we don't have a shiny surface uh, it's all matte even before we sand it so that's why the the dusting with a dark color is really helpful because you can't see the reflection um, of the unsanded parts but with a bright surface um, a, a, a shiny gloss surface it's real easy when you get the light at just the right angle it's real easy to see where you where you still need to sand a little bit more every time you wipe it off it's very apparent so you just wipe wipe and sand wipe and sand wipe and sand Okay, a little bit right in here, along the bottom of the keel. Um, and we're almost done. This is fairly quick. Um, you, know, you probably have an hour or so into sanding this down nicely. Um, well, actually, probably maybe a little bit more. But it's, such, it's fun. It's delicate work. But it's not physically demanding at all. <laughs> it's very light sanding, very light work. And um, it's fun to get it just right. And as you move through it, you'll see how perfect it's turning out. Okay, and that's that's all done there. Teensy a little bit right there. I'll sand a little bit more, but I don't want to go through anywhere. Okay, that should do it. Yeah, that got it. Okay, and now just a teensy bit at the very back. It really doesn't matter with these fine grits what direction you sand. They're not, there's no wood grain anymore, so you, you can sand sideways. Or forward and backwards or at an angle doesn't make any difference at this point because it's just a single uniform surface okay I think we've got that do not sand don't sand excessively just sand to where the shiny parts gone and stop
Okay, and here's my bucket of water right here for dipping in. Um, use plenty of water because otherwise it gets kind of filled uh, up with the uh, sanding, sanding dust. Um, and it's nice to have clean water uh, while you're sanding. Okay, I think that covers wet sanding pretty well. Uh, we'll tune back in um, when we finish the sides and as we progress into some of the finer grits and especially with the buffing, we'll give you some tips on that. Okay, now the in inevitable question, uh, what happens if I sand through? And, um, oh dear, oh dear. No, it's not really a problem. Um, you can see right there at the bow, it's pretty hard to tell actually when you sand it through. They sand it through the clear. Pretty hard to tell because you're you've got layers of white underneath and then clear on top. Um, you have to have the reflection exactly right to be able to see it even. But you can see at the front there, I have sanded through just that short area there. And um, so uh, I'm going to tape it off and then respray it and let it sit overnight. And then it'll all be good. Um, now in taping it off, I'm going to use rolled tape, um, fairly wide blue tape. And then I'm going to roll it with the sticky side out. And what that does is um, it keeps her from being, I want a tube of rolled tape. It keeps her from uh, having, so I'll zoom out a little bit so we can see better. Um, keeps her from having a um, sharp edge where the tape, um, where you've taped off. And uh, because a little spray will get under the edge of the tube, the rolled tape tube. It's a little tricky to do this, but uh, not exactly hard. It's just kind of tricky. Um, there we go. Um, so, uh, and the the other advantage is um, you're you can stick paper right to the surface of it, and um, to to shield the area around where you're where you're spraying. Um, and uh, so we'll roll the tape. Gosh, it is sticking to my fingers more than it sticks to itself, but we're getting it. Um, roll the tape. And uh, then make a little barrier with the rolled tape. Don't, don't spray any more than you need to. There's no point in spraying farther out than you want to. And um, that's one of the reasons we left the tape on um, for the gunnels, uh, the, for the um, rubber rail, uh, because Partly we didn't want to mess it up with sanding, and, but partly so we can spray it again. Okay, it looks like it's about here. A little overspray is not going to hurt because we just sand it like the same material we just were working on. Um, but uh, no point in doing extra sanding. And then we'll cut a piece of paper just along there. That should work fine. And then we'll just, we don't want to blast it, you know, real heavily. We just want a real light um, touch up. And then uh, the only disadvantage is that then you, you will have to wait. And let's tape the back side so we're not going to sand that again. We have that nicely sanded. So we'll tape the back side there. And uh, for any overspray, let that tape hang down a bit. And um, then we should be good. So just a light spray, um, we're not going to sand through a second time, and uh, let it set overnight at least, and then you should be good. Now if you spray under the tape, you're going to have a hard tape line, so you just want to, let's try this, yeah, just want to spray from the top. And that does it. Tomorrow we'll sand that down. Well, this a little bit more. Right? Remember, reflection is the only way to tell how you've done. Okay. And if it's horizontal, you can spray a little bit heavier. You won't have runs and sags. Uh, but if it's not horizontal, be careful. And let's take that right off now. Yeah, that looks good. Um, and I'm just going to prop the boat up. Uh, sorry, you can't really see what we're doing, can you? Um, we took the tape off, and we're going to prop the boat up so that sits horizontal just while it's setting up, and then we'll be all set. And tomorrow we can sand it in, and it'll blend right in. That really is why wet sanding is such a nice technique 
because um, you're blending, you can recoat, you can sand out any blemishes. Uh, you have all sorts of options. It's not like, you know, if I'd had to get a perfect finish over the whole boat because I had a little flaw, um, that would be a lot more work and a lot harder. You might have a flaw someplace else all of a sudden, a run or a sag. So um, that's why wet sanding is such a good technique. Although we have had the boat looking beautiful um, several times right after the white paint it looked beautiful you could stop then uh, right after the uh, clear sprayed on uh, that looked beautiful you could stop then but after the and you'd have a beautiful boat um, uh, but if you want it absolutely perfect there's nothing to rival uh, this process of wet sanding and then buffing because you will get it absolutely perfect that way okay so um, don't don't neglect, if you've sanded through someplace, don't just say, well, nothing I can do about it or neglect that area. Just hit it again with a little bit more uh, clear and then sand that in and um, you'll have it perfect again. Okay, I think it's, uh, it should be good. I don't think that'll sag now. Okay, good job. Well, tomorrow we'll sand out that last bit. And then we'll start with 800 grit, and then we'll move on to 1,000, 1,200, 1,500, 2,000. Those, those go pretty quickly. The trick with um, each grit is don't skip any area. Um, for instance, with the 600, if you skipped one little area that had some stippling, it would be a lot harder to sand out with 800. If you got up to 1,000 grit, you'd be working. It'll sand out eventually, but it'll take five times as long. So um, with each grit, don't skip any areas. Just be meticulous about uh, sanding everything to, to fully to that level of grit and then move on to the next grit. But it doesn't take very long just because you're not, you're not changing much when you just have a jump of 200 um, in, in the grit, uh, den you know, the grit density. Actually, it's the density per square inch uh, is how the grit is counted. So 800 as 800 particles per square inch um, and uh, or maybe per linear inch um, anyways uh, the density of the grit is how sandpaper is rated and so when you get up to 1200 it has a lot of and 2500 has really fine grit because it has so many particles per per inch I think or per square inch I'm not sure okay uh, there we go um, we'll be back at it tomorrow Okay, now we're up to uh, 1500 uh, there, and um, I want to show you how quick this is and easy each step. Uh, I didn't, I did not find uh, 1200. I'm not sure if they make it or not. If I don't have it, they probably don't make it because I should try to have every grit that is available. But maybe it's just uh, they were out of it or didn't have it at the hardware store where I got uh, where I get most of my uh, supplies. But um, it is an excellent hardware store that has almost everything, so I'm now curious whether they make 1,200 or not. Anyway, yes, this, as you get into these finer grits, skipping from 1,000 to 1,500, it should not be a problem. And um, so this is how you do it. Um, now, uh, a couple of points I wanted to make was uh, make sure you haven't put your sandpaper down anywhere where there might be uh, some grit on the table or something, because if you have a little one little teensy piece of grit, and you start sanding, um, you're going to make a massive scratch, and it might not. Well, it may be hard to sand that out actually, because um, it's going to be like, <laughs> any kind of grit that you can feel at all is a lot bigger than 1500 uh, grit. So um, be careful of that. And uh, the other point is, um, we're not no longer. I think I mentioned this before. We're no longer sanding wood grain, so it's not just a matter of. Uh, you know, back and forth with the wood grain uh, now, um, a variety of strokes is actually your best bet at this point. And so you can sand in any direction. At the front I find it's best to sand right up. You don't want to sand over the edge. If you sand over that bow edge, um, I might just touch that just very lightly like that. But you, you really sand it at all and uh, rather than just brush it and um, you'll be through any coating on the sharp edge. And the same is true along the sides. So on the sides, I'll uh, often get so I can sand right along the side, but not over the side. So right, feeling the side with my finger that's just on the edge, 
and I'm um, sanding right up to the edge but not over the edge. Okay, so some of the sanding will be, and use plenty of water, um, some of the sanding will be uh, lined up with the hull, the length of the hull, but I like the sanding, I like the circular stroke too, um, and I think that used both, both strokes over the whole area. And especially up under the rub rail, use the, use the curved over edge of the sandpaper um, to sand right up under the overhang of the rub rail because that would be an easy area to just miss entirely. Okay, so um, we're, not we're not trying to take off much material at this point. We're really not taking off any material at all. We're just trying to smooth out the scratches, the teensy little scratches from the thousand grit sandpaper. So um, it doesn't take very much. So that area is quite thoroughly done now. Now I'm back to here and in another minute I'll have the rest of the hull completed. And now this part's done. So I'm about halfway back. But I do want to show you one more thing here while I have your attention. Um, it was this side. Well, it's going to be hard to show you even because I can't quite remember. Yeah, it was this side I believe. Um, right up in here is where we had the little, uh, where we'd sand it through and did the little uh, touch up. And I'm going to wipe this off and you can see if you can see anything, but I don't think you'll be able to see very much. Anyway, it should blend in almost perfectly. So that's where the touch up was. And it's, it's pretty darn good. I don't think we're ever going to, we'll forget where that is pretty quick, I think. Okay, so um, I'll finish up with the 1500 and then 2000 and then 2500 and then we'll be back with you with the buffing compound. But I just wanted to show you how quick and easy this wet sanding is. Each grit really goes fast. As long as you don't skip grits. If you skip grits, it's a lot more work and a lot slower. Okay, we finished uh, sanding with the 2500. And you can see it's a really essentially almost perfect uh, matte finish now. And a matte finish can be attractive on a boat. It doesn't necessarily have to be a gloss. But if you've gone this far, you may want to keep going. The only reason for having a matte finish on a boat usually um, and there's there's three finishes that you can choose from. One is a matte, which essentially doesn't have really any gloss. Very smooth, but no gloss. And then a satin finish, which has a small amount of gloss, and then a high gloss finish. Um, so this is a matte finish at this stage. Um, but it's very easy to keep going with the buffing compounds and um, create... Now this is the heavy cut buffing compound. That's a little bit dry there. With the buffing compounds, there are two approaches. Um, you can use uh, a series of four different um, compounds uh, from heavy cut to medium cut to fine cut to something uh, often called swirl remover. So four different steps, each one being a finer grit. Um, the other approach is to use a uh, combined um, buffing compound. And um, these are all the compounds I'm using today are Meguiar's. That works fine, but I think you know, it's basically grit and a paste, and any manufacturer probably does pretty similar stuff. But um, these combined ones uh, start cutting fast with fairly, fairly heavy grit, um, and then the grit breaks down as you polish it more to a fine grit. Uh, so they're supposed to be a one-step buffing compound. But overall, I think you do less work if you just use the four steps. Um, and get better, you know, slightly better results, although it's probably not going to be that much different if you do a good job. Um, the, this one is a little bit sticky and dry. I'm not sure that's working so well. So I'm going to add some of the, some of the combined one because uh, I'm almost out of that heavy cut and I think it's dried up a little bit since I used it. Um, oh, remember to shake your shake or mix or stir your compounds. Um, and be careful these bottles, if you drop them they tend to crack, and that's no good. Um, so uh, this combined one will start with the coarser grit initially. Yeah, that's thinning that stuff. It was kind of sludgy. And again, a variety of patterns, uh, circular patterns and forward and aft patterns. 
and essentially just rubbing it till it kind of blends in and it almost disappears. Um, so that's uh, you know, that's about that first part is almost done. Although that thicker stuff really is a bit of an irritation. Uh, so I'm, I'm probably going to do the whole boat first with this combined, um, since the thicker stuff is really kind of thick. Although I can feel the difference in the grit. The thicker stuff is definitely grittier um, than this combined stuff, um, and so it probably makes a faster job. So maybe I'll keep combining the two use the thicker stuff in the combined stuff just so I can make it uh, get through <laughs> really what I should do is go buy some well what I will do is go buy some of the heavy cut cleaner um, so I have some more but I'm eager to do this now so I'll keep going at it uh, for now with this combination effect heavy grit and the one step one okay so that's about all there is to it, if you have a little buffer, you could use it, but doing it by hand is going to do a pretty, I'm pushing pretty hard, and the faster you rub, the less time you have to rub. The big thing is don't skip any place, because if you skip one step, it's going to take a lot of, a lot of buffing with the next step to get that part up to speed. And uh, all of this process, you know, at this stage, you have such a beautiful finish and such a smooth hull and everything, it's just like you're caressing it. It's just a real pleasure to be working with it at this point. That's why <laughs> that's why the polishing and the fine sanding are so much fun and not really like work at all. It's just like you're admiring your boat, running your hand over it and enjoying how smooth it's gotten and beautiful. So um, a fun part of the process, a little time consuming, but not, not difficult, not terribly time consuming. However, oh, it could have stopped a long time ago, um, you know, right after our sp sprayed coat, or I mean, if you want the, a wood wood looking hull, you could have stopped um, with the varnish and then just added a couple more coats of varnish um, and had a really nice hull as well. So a lot of different ways to approach this finishing. You could have stopped um, after just the painting, uh, spraying the paint on, that would have been a perfectly adequate finish as well quite you know can be quite a nice finish actually so um, this is just icing on the cake everything that we've done since the painting is icing on the cake but um, it's a real pleasure it's, it's fun uh, um, one comment though um, the reason some boats are matte finish or satin finish is if there are any imperfections in the hull if you go to a gloss all those imperfections become really obvious because the light is reflecting off the hull in distorted ways if there's any imperfection. So if you're not sure your hull is quite perfect, um, not to worry, but you might not want to go to the high gloss finish. Okay, so that side's done with the um, first in the sequence of buffing compounds. And um, then we'll do the other three sides, the bottom, two bottoms and the other side. And then we'll move on to the medium cut cleaner, then the fine cut cleaner, and then the um, shore oil remover and we'll show you each step. You can't really see a difference um, between each step. You're not looking like, oh I missed that place. You're just trying to remember where you covered because there's really no visible difference. In, but between the beginning point and the end point where it's a high gloss, there's a huge difference of course. So um, at this point you can't really tell where you've done except by making sure you've covered all the surface thoroughly. Okay, now I just wanted to, we've just done the medium cut cleaner and cleaned it off pretty thoroughly. If that was our ending point, we'd clean it off more thoroughly. But uh, we now have what really would be called a satin finish. Um, it's, it's a gloss, it's just not a high gloss. And that could be, uh, Carl out in Hawaii uh, prefers a satin finish and that can be very effective. But we're going to take it two steps farther and go for a high gloss finish on this one. Um, just partly because it's so much fun polishing it, and um, partly, yeah, it'll look great with a high gloss finish. Couple of notes, make sure you do your rudder at the same time so you don't have to play catch up with that. Um, have it sitting where you'll see it each step or else you'll probably forget it. Um, and uh, so keep it up with the other steps. Oh, and the other thing is, you can see I'm working on a cardboard uh, box. Uh, it's nice to have, if you're working on a hard table, put some foam or you know, some significant thicknesses of cardboard or paper on top of the table. So 
you're not worried about scarring or denting the hull uh, as you roll it over to work on different surfaces. And um, I think that's, that's the only points I have here at this point, at this moment. Um, on to the fine cut cleaner and then the swirl remover and I'll show you the results of those two steps. But I think you can see that glimmer, the gleam of and I haven't wiped, uh, I mean, I've, you do want to wipe off the grit from each stage because otherwise when you're doing the next stage uh, you're really not doing a finer grit if there's a lot of grit left over. So you want to, but um, I think, you, the, so I haven't wiped this off totally, but you can see that it's starting to have a nice, you know, quite a bit of reflection there. You can see the uh, fluorescent light reflected in it from above. Um, and uh, it'll be a lot shinier though after the final finishes, final two grits. Okay, here we are. Four different uh, levels of buffing compound later. And we have what is close to a perfect finish. Look at that gloss on there. There's no way you can get a gloss paint surface of this quality, no matter how good you are. Uh, we're pretty good here, but no way you can do that. Not a, no dust bump or bubble or blemish of any kind anywhere in it. So it's really quite a fun project when you finish it up. You think, oh, it's not changing grid after grid after grid. It looks the same. Well, you finish it up and, uh, gosh, it's spectacular. The sides, sides just as glossy as the bottom and um, really, really comes out beautiful. So uh, it's really worth doing, um, taking the time to do it right. And we really we just use paper towel all the way through until the very end. That last coat we were um, uh, the, the swirl remover. We buffed it out mostly with paper towel, but then we switched to a really fine uh, microfiber cloth. Any kind of soft cotton cloth would be fine though. But uh, look at that finish all all the way back. Now is it absolutely perfect? Well, it's pretty darn good. <laughs> um, but I'll show you. There always, there's always going to be something that the builder sees that probably nobody else will notice. But um, you know, you'll be able to see it uh, when I point it out. But look at it. Isn't it shining gorgeous? Um, so right back here on the skeg, I went, I didn't sand all the way through, but it, you can see the lighter color. You can see the wood tone through, um, through there. But uh, I'm not worried about that. It's still protected with two coats of varnish and and there is some uh, primer and paint over the varnish there. It's not down to the varnish. So um, would I do anything differently? Um, yeah, I'd do the same process but I might do a second coat of white paint. Just, you know, if, if everything was totally even um, that would have been adequate but uh, I might do three coats of white paint uh, spraying on, uh, separated by enough drawing time that we didn't get sagging or running. And then on the acrylic clear, I think I'd, I might do three coats of that too, because essentially I did two coats, just I s kept spraying. I sprayed all the way around and then started again without quite enough pause. I mean, it turned out great, but I did have the one slump um, below the, right on the bottom. I think it was right in along here. Um, sanded out perfectly um, so there's no no sign of it. I, you just can't see any sign of it at all. Um, look at that gloss. That's the, uh, reflecting the uh, LED lights above. Uh, um, but uh, no sign of that at all. Sanded out perfectly but um, you know it's a nuisance to have to sand extra. So, um, so I think I'd probably uh, space the coats of acrylic clear just a little bit farther apart, um, maybe five minutes between finishing and starting the next coat. And I probably do three coats of acrylic clear because remember I did have to respray that little area at the bow where I'd sanded through. So um, that's the only difference. Uh, otherwise, I just am totally. Am I totally pleased? Yes, I'm totally pleased. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it turned out absolutely fabulous. Okay, now, uh, at this point, you think, oh, well, that really went well. Well, yeah, it did. Um, but you can still mess up because we have layers and layers of paint over our tape. 
and uh, if we just start peeling the tape off we're going to pull up some of the paint and cause a messy joint there uh, where the paint has pulled off of the side of the hull in a jagged irregular fashion and that would not be nice so to avoid that we're going to very carefully take a mat knife and um, take a look at this mat knife see the tip that's not a typical mat knife tip is it uh, usually the mat knives come to a point I would be hesitant about using a pointed mat knife on this job this just um, is you know a regular pointed mat knife tip that we grind we just rub it on a sharpening stone until we have a rounded tip there the rounded tip in my estimation is going to work a lot better because I think it will follow it won't it'll track a little bit better in the groove or in the um, corner between and this is going to be hard my hands going to be right in the way um, it'll track in the corner between the side of the boat and top sides of the boat and the rub rail and that's what we want we want to make sure if it does get off track we want to make it cut out across the rub rail we don't want it to cut up this along the side so we're angling it so the angle is a little bit closer to the angle of the side and don't have your fingers where uh, where if you slip I don't know if you can see my hands right in the way isn't it we're just sliding the knife right along the joint between the rub rail and the um, side of the boat push put, with enough pressure that we're cutting through however many <laughs> however many coats of the varnish the tape went on after the varnish so we're not cutting through that but we're cutting through three layers of primer and then two layers of paint and then um, the acrylic clear so a fair amount of pressure and if it's a little bit too much pressure that's you know it's better than too little I think in this case and uh, just very carefully and keep your angle more about 30 degrees from the side angle of the side and about 60 degrees up from the angle of the uh, rub rail the 90 degree angle there and now it should peel off really quite clean if it's not coming off clean then um, run the knife along there again because um, otherwise you'll be taking flex, flicks of paint uh, flex of paint up off the side of the boat and that'll look pretty messy okay so um and uh, another approach which wouldn't be a, wouldn't be a bad idea but I don't think it's necessary because this is working well and I'm too lazy to do it um, would be to untape it in the middle and retape it the same way just so you don't have as many layers of paint build up but um, even then uh, you could cause problems by peeling it off without using a knife so overall I think this is probably the best way now here Oh, that's just dust, isn't it? I thought we had a little paint there. But since there's varnish on the wood, um, if there's a little paint blood through someplace, it's not a big issue because um, it's not deep into the wood grain uh, because the varnish is sealing the wood. Okay, and this is going to look just stunning. Yeah, that's just dust. Okay, so that's, that's the technique. Um, it's probably trickiest at the drake tail, but um, it'll work the same. But I would, um, I definitely think it's worth, and and actually, I use this uh, rounded tip blade uh, that we just ground off um, for many, many things, and I find it works much better than the sharp tip. And also, you can resharpen it, and you never have to buy another tip until you've sharpened it till, till there's nothing left, which would probably be a lifetime of use. Okay. Uh, well, we're real pleased with the way it turned out. Look at that. Look at that gloss. The big problem at this point in the project is you don't want to just, you want to keep moving ahead, not just admiring your work constantly. Um, but it does look super. And uh, a lot of fun polishing it. Uh, it's just a real, real nice feeling appreciating how lovely the boat is as you, as you polish it up. And, uh, yeah, I can't help filming it again. 
<laughs> having a light overhead really shows how glossy that comes out. Um, and before the buffing compound, it's really not glossy, it's just a matte finish. But when you add that buffing compound, you get uh, an essentially perfect finish. And it's such a pleasure. Okay, well, I'll get the rest of the tape off, and then we'll rejoin you. There's not too much left. We'll be installing the uh, installing the electric motor. This is going to be an electric version um, rather than a steam-powered version. And then we'll be putting the furniture in place inside. And that's all varnished and looks great. And um, then we'll be christening her pretty soon. <laughs> okay. And uh, been a great project. You may have noticed the clothing shift um, from when this project was started and think, oh my gosh, does it really take six months to build? I don't think it was six months, but um, no, it's it really doesn't take that much longer than watching the video does. Um, the video is real time and I expect we filmed probably about 50% of the building time. So it probably takes twice as long as watching the video, maybe a little bit longer, but not a whole lot longer. We filmed almost everything pretty pretty fully and completely. So um, not to worry about that. I've just had, oh, we just got totally buried in orders um, this spring and into the beginning of the summer. And um, I just got back from my daughter's graduation from UMass Law School. And that was 10 days. So there have been, and writing the instructions and filming uh, the process <clears throat> takes a, more, more time than anybody could ever quite imagine more of the time than I can imagine at least so um so not to worry about how long it's going to take it's actually a fairly fairly fast project and super fun my only frustration is having to uh set it aside to fill orders <laughs> um, because people are eager to get their boats um so now it's almost finished I am so pleased and Maybe I'll just ignore orders for <laughs> the last part of this project and just keep working on it because I enjoy it so much. Okay, we'll be back soon.